Okay, we'll start again. We had some awesome stuff last week, uh, some stuff that I thought was very, very sweet in the Torah. Um, so just to, to, to get our bearings, because we're going to get to the story of Rav Rabbi this week. And when we start that story, we're going to have to remember some of the things from the beginning that are important to the flow. So um, remember that the main thing that we started off with was that um, I'm just going to mute everybody here because there's some sound coming through. Yeah. Um, the, the main thing, the, the way the Torah started was that <laughs> to draw peace into the world. We have to raise up the kavod of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to its root, which is Yira. To bring peace into the world, we have to raise up the kavod of Hashem to its root, which is Yira, fear or awe of Hashem. Lira Hashem and Nichbad. And then we went through this whole thing about Torah's Chesed, the Torah of kindness, which is giving learning Torah in order to be able to give it over to other people, to draw them closer to Hashem, to draw those that are far away from Hashem to be close to Hashem. Um, that's the Torah's Chesed. And we saw that this can only happen when, when remember, Yisro, which is uh, going to be um, this week's Parsha. Right? Beautiful, beautiful Ashkach Pratis. Yisrael, who was, who, who was a convert. A convert and a Baal Tshuva are the, are the two greatest examples of the glory of Hashem in the world. When someone who's far away, whether because they were born not Jewish or whether because they were born not religious or they went off the religious path for a while and came back, this is the greatest honor to Hashem. Right? Says the Zayar. And the only way that we can draw people like this closer to Hashem is through um, tshuva, is through spreading out the Torah to them. We said, and then when we do this, all these crazy spiritual things happen. The Torah's chesed that we speak brings spiritual reality into the world and brings the aleph base of creation into the world. And that olive base goes and accomplishes things in the spiritual realms. It causes root neshamas to be awakened and elevated. If you remember, we said that there's 600,000 letters in the Torah and that the name Yisrael that refers to the Jewish people is an acronym for Yeshishim Riboy Oisis Torah. There are 600,000 letters to the Torah, meaning that the root soul of every Jew is connected to one of those 600,000 letters of the Torah. And when we speak out our Torah, that, those, that Aleph base, which represents the neshamas, goes and, and wakes up the neshamas of, of, of Jews. So we find ourselves experiencing, experiencing um, inspiration all of a sudden. Sometimes we just wake up a little bit in a spiritual way, and we, we change our behavior, we change the way we look at things. Someone's Torah in the world has, 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 has brought this Aleph base into the world that wakes us up. And so too, this, it's this Torah, it's this Aleph base that comes out from our mouths that interacts with each other and makes Zivugim coming together and creates the, the souls of converts. So our Torah is precious and our Torah is, is, our Torah is pure and holy. And it's so important. It brings elevation and it brings inspiration into the world. And so we said, right, that a Talmud Chacham has to, has to learn Torah with this type of kavana, with this type of intent, in order to be able to draw down a holy neshama for the children that he's going to have. If you remember. Then we said one story of Rabbi Baruch Hanna, which, we, uh, which, we finished, which we finished off already. And then we said this concept, we got into this concept last time about this beautiful idea about how through the story of Rabbi Barchana that people who were not born a tzaddik, people who are born not Jewish or not religious or people who are religious and fall off, we have these layers of clothing on us that are called begadim tzayim, soiled garments. And these... These are the things that block us and make it hard for us to connect back to Hashem. That's why it's a struggle to get back to Hashem. We've been through a lot spiritually. 
our, the root of our neshamas have tikkunim to make. And we've been places and we've come into the world in a certain way. So we have to break through those in order to get close to Hashem. That's our whole struggle, our whole life, is us just trying to take layer after layer off and expose our deepest, most inner connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to holiness. And remember we said, every step of the way, it's not really in this Torah, but every step of the way, when we experience a new struggle and a new challenge, it's not because we're falling back and we're getting challenged. It's because we're moving forward. And at every new level, we encounter new forces that are trying to hold us back from, from reaching a higher level. So when we're facing struggles, we have to know that, that really I'm, I've, I've elevated myself to a new level. I'm actually at a, at a new high point. And, and I have new avoided to do in this place. Right? It's, 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 it's very encouraging, right, to think about this is literally the opposite way that the world would see, would see the situation. I'm facing difficulty. This is so hard. Why am I facing another challenge? Hashem must hate me, Chas Shalom, someone might say. Really? No. This is you actually getting closer and doing better and growing more. It's like, it's like Hashem is giving you a nod, a pat on the back. You're doing a great job. Beautiful. And... Um, and so, yeah, we brought all these ideas, the beautiful ideas that we have, to, we have to purify our souls, take off these garments, and, and approach Hashem. So now we're starting on page 312, I think. Yeah, we're starting on page 312. Uh, one second. 314 um, in the black book. Ois um, Ches in the Hebrew, letter eight, number eight in the English. The last thing we said was this concept of of Yira. The very first thing in the Torah, and we have to remember this, was that we have to elevate Yira to its proper source. source. The, elevate the honor of Hashem to its, to its source, which is Yira. Fear and, 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 and awe of Hashem. So we're going to discuss now in this Torah what it means to us as individuals and to the Klal, what it means Yira. And, 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 and how, how does that relate to everything that we learned so far? So, okay, letter Ches. Yeah, we just uh, to recap letter Vav, which is just on the previous page. We had said that the way that a person can tell how have they elevated the honor of Hashem is the extent to its shorish, to its root in Yira, is the extent to which a person is able to honor other people who are Yireh Hashem. How, how, to what level am I able to give kavod, to give honor to those people in the world who are Yireh Hashem? Yireh Hashem is a term, literally it means those who fear Hashem, or those who are in awe of Hashem. And, and it's used generally, just generally referring to very, very holy people. Very holy people. So the extent to which I'm able to do, to, to show honor to them, is the extent to which I'm really holding in this level of elevating the honor of Hashem to its, to its source in Yira. So, you know, you see, I, I know a number of people who struggle very much with being able to, to, to be mechabed, and to, to be mechabel, to receive Torah from holy people. And they just can't. They have to fight every step of the way. They can't give honor to, to, to other people. And they always have to put people down. Or, or they, have to, they have to make jokes. Right? They can't do it. So the level that we're able to give honor to other people, to holy people, is we can see how we're doing. It's like a litmus test. How I'm doing at raising up the honor of Hashem. And the last thing we said, which was very, very important and very serious and very special, is that the place where we see this is in our heart. The place of Yira is in the heart, right? Um, and as we saw that, uh, that the Yeshayahu, the Navi, was talking about how they were serving Hashem um, with only lip service. Yeah, they were saying a lot of prayers and bringing a lot of korbanas, but their heart wasn't in it. Only the heart is the real true litmus test is the real true place where we can see how, how we view Yire Hashem and how we connect to Hashem. So like we said, the one idea is 
if someone, if a holy person walks into the room, we know that the minig is that we stand up for that person because it's a holy person, right? But like we said, only each individual person who stands up knows why they're standing up. Am I standing up because I really want to show honor to this person? Or am I standing up because, because uh, I just have to? Yeah, I'm testing. I'm going to listen to this person. He's probably not that holy, but I'm going to listen. I'll just stand up like everyone else just to, uh, so I can test this person, right? That's not a holy person. That's, that's, that's not yira. That's not kavod, right? Or I'm going to show everybody that I stand up for holy people so people think that I'm holy, <laughs> right? Yeah, look at me. I know what I'm doing. I'm very holy. I stand up for holy people. It's not about honoring that person. It's about, it's about looking, looking, look how holy I am. I stand up for people, for holy people, right? You hear what I'm saying? But in the heart, you can't fake it. You know why you're standing up. Only each of us know why we're standing up. Only each of us know why, when we give tzedakah to somebody, why am I doing it? Right? Am I doing it so, so that uh, I'll be honored? Right? Do I do it, uh, someone gave me some tzedakah today, and they said, I want this to be, to be anonymous. Right? person's listening right now. <laughs> but did they, did they do it because they wanted to be anonymous? I'm not saying this. I know you're listening right now, but this is not what I'm saying about you individually. But such a person, they could say, yeah, I want to be anonymous, so I really want to do it in the right way, which is the way this person's doing it. Or a person can say, give it to one person, say, yeah, I want to make this anonymous. Because I want that person to know that I'm so holy that I'm making it anonymous. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You still have to tell the one person that it's anonymous. You know what I mean? So, but what's in your heart? That's all that matters. In my heart... Am I giving this tzedakah in an anonymous way because I want it to be the best way and I want to honor the person who's, who the tzedakah is going to and I don't want them to feel bad and I want to do it all for the right reason, right? Only a person knows in their heart. That's where we finished off. Let's get going. Letter ches. Okay, this is going to be awesome. When a person returns this, this kavod, the glory, honor, back to its root, which is yira, then all of the pegamim, the blemishes of the yira, are, are fixed, are completed, are complete. Then we merit peace. So what is peace? Peace means, nishlam, shalom, peace, means to be whole. Means to be one complete unit. So when in, in society, when there's peace, it means that all the people in the society are functioning as one whole. One whole, W-H-O-L-E, right? And as soon as there's a pagam in the peace, there's a blemish in it, right? Like look at uh, everywhere in the world right now, but especially in America right now, and you have this group going against this group and everyone's fighting back and forth. They're all individual factions. They're fragmented pieces that are not one big whole. They're all against each other. That is the opposite of peace. Peace means that there's a one complete unit of wholeness and completeness that functions together. Right? So, when there's a blemish in, 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 in Yira, in fear of Hashem, in awe of Hashem, it creates fragmentation. So let's read on a little further and see how we can understand how this fragmentation appears on a, on a, on a community level and on an individual level, in the klal and in the prat. There's two types of shalom, says Rabbi Nachman. There is a piece that is in one's, a person's bones, an inner piece. This is what it says, an inner peace. Because in the beginning, first, in the peace process, let's call it, <laughs> the, the, a person needs to first deal with the peace, the inner peace that, is, is, that has to do with their own self, their own body, their own personality, their own existence. Because sometimes there's not peace. Like the Pasuk says in Tehillim, there's no peace in my, in my bones. I don't have any inner peace. 
because of my sins, my sin. But it's through fear or awe of Hashem that I merit to have peace within myself, inner peace. Like the holy Zayar says, In a place where we find fear of Hashem, here comes your Hawaiian friend, there you will find shalom, shalimta, peace, wholeness. Kemoisha Kosov, like the Pasik says, Ki ein machsor lireav. There's nothing lacking to those who fear you. Whoa, we're going to see a deeper level of this Pasik. This is awesome. Okay, so like this. The picture that we're building here is that when there's a pagam in Yira, there's a, there's a blemish in our fear and awe of Hashem, it ruins our peace. And we're, we're, how does our peace get ruined? Is through our sins, through, through our behaving improperly with Hashem. So what does this mean? Like this. Another aspect... Okay, there's a few ways to explain this. This is deep stuff. Another aspect of peace, of shalom. We're talking about shalom and peace as a whole functioning unit that everything works together. Right? So my body... Really, my, my, not my body, my existence, my existence is really two separate parts that come together to act as one. We could call it um, the guf and the neshama, the body and the soul. We could, we could call it, in another way, a nefesh elokis and a nefesh bahamas. We could call it uh, uh, our holy, our godly soul and our animal soul. We could call it our, 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 our Yitzhar Toiv and our Yitzhahara. All of these things are kind of talking about the same thing. And when, when I'm existing in a way that my body and my soul are working together to accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish, to connect to Hashem, to bring Kedusha into the world, then everything is flowing together Everything's working together, and I'm just at peace because I'm, 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 I'm everything, every part of me is moving towards the same place. But as soon as I have an, a war within myself, I'm going to say this in two ways. The first way is, let's think of a simple way, of physical desire, and let's use food. So let's say... Um, I'm trying to become more spiritual and less physical. And I'm trying to move away from eating too much food. Or maybe I'm trying to become kosher, but I'm not there yet. And I have real desires for things like shrimp and bacon, let's say. Or whatever your, uh, your, your, your desire is for, right? Nachos, maybe, who knows, right? So I have this desire for food, right? And so what's going on? is that I want to not eat this food. I want to be closer to Hashem. I want to do mitzvahs. I don't want to do averas. But my body is pulling me. My physical desires are pulling me towards this food. There's a war going on inside me. And I'm not comfortable because of it. I'm not at peace because of it. Because I don't want to do it. But at the same time, I do want to do it. I'm fighting against myself. It's a war. It's the opposite of peace going on inside me. Right? And we're both, these two sides of me, are not working on the same goal. Mashain Kain. So I'm not comfortable. Why? Because then even if I do eat the thing, right? How am I going to feel? I'm going to feel terrible. Yeah, I, I gave in. I lost the war. I lost the war to this one. Now I'm going to feel bad about myself. So too, with, 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 with other, other midas, like ego, for example. Person's a Balgaiva or a Balkas, anger or ego, right? I don't want to be this person who gets angry. I don't want to do it. But something happens and the blood starts to boil. The blood starts to boil and I start going and I start going and really I want to hold myself back. But, but, but I just can't do it and it's really hard and I'm getting riled up and I'm getting angry and, and, and I don't want to do it, but I do want to do it. There's a war going on inside me. There's no peace. It's like I'm fighting a battle within myself. Oh, Masha'in Kain. 
the person who has done this work on themselves. The person of full emuna. What do I always say about emuna? The person? Calm confidence, right? This person of emuna is not fighting a battle. This person is just trying to direct everything towards the same path. This person who's, who's worked on their midas, who's worked on their character traits, and worked on all these things, they're, they're, they're not experiencing this type of situation. Because when something comes up, they say, okay, I see. You know, uh, like the holy Rav Mata Frank said, uh, I was by one of a suda by him in, in Uman. And he said, so uh, uh, Sandra and I talked about this one time. He said, what do, uh, what do you do when the Yetzirah comes to you? Right? You're, you're, you're in your house, Yetzirah comes to you. Something, right? Don't, don't try to push him away. You're never going to win. If you just say, oh, Yetzirah, no, 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 get away. Don't, no, no, no. It's, you're never going to win. You first have to invite him in, invite the Yetzirah in, give him a piece of kugel, Right? Allow him to sit for a few minutes, maybe a cup of tea, and then you say, okay, thank you, you can go now. That's enough. Right? Meaning, when, when you've been through this a few times, and the Yitzhahara comes to you, you say, okay, ah, I see. I see you're here. I see you're here. Right? Let's, let's just relax a little bit. I know, I know who you are. I see you're coming to me. Let's just be with you for a few minutes, and when you calm down a little bit, I'll just let you go, right? A little bit more on the path to peace. There's no war. There's just a recognition. Something's happening now, and, and, and I'm going to deal with this in a calm, confident way, and I'm going to allow the Yitzhar to move. I'm going to allow the war. I'm not going to allow the war to start. But as soon as I start, right away, fighting, 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 war, 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 there's a battle going on, Right? So sometimes that's the, that's the right approach. But it really shows us what we're talking about over here. This is within myself. The war. It's the first step. L'chaim. So. Kashem. Ukashayesh. Shalom ba'atzama. When a person has peace within himself. A person is, is calm. And, has, and ha- is not fighting within himself. Az. Then that person is able to daven. Because the main tefillah comes through yira. Comes through fear or awe of Hashem. Like the Pasuk says in Mishlei. Isha yiras Hashem hi tishalal. The Pasuk says, by Isha's chayal. Right? A woman. Yiras Hashem. Isha yiras Hashem. A woman who fears Hashem. Hi tishalal. She shall be praised. The other way to read that is a woman who has fear of Hashem, someone who has fear of Hashem, that's where a tehillah, that's where praise of Hashem can come from. Only once she has that, then she can praise Hashem. With yira, you can praise Hashem. With yira, you can daven. Right? So, once I have this peace and, and I get to this level, now I'm able to daven. I'm able to pray. And this person who's going crazy. Imagine for yourself like this. This is a good example. Think of yourself at a time when you're very busy and stressed and there's a lot going on and you're being pulled many different ways and it could be in, in business, it could be in family, it could be with all different life things going on, it could be with your own Avodah Hashem, whatever it is. You're being pulled every different way and, and some bad things are happening. Maybe some good things are happening, but it's too much, whatever it is, right? How hard is it to daven? Right? When you're going all over the place and you have, you're not clear and you're not focused and you don't have inner peace, it's, it's impossible to daven properly. It's very, very hard. Masha'in Kain, when this yira is elevated and I'm living in this state, oh, now I can daven. Yira in the right place is the, is the, is the beginning of prayer. Because how do we see this also? Prayer is now in the place of korbanas, of, of sacrifices in the temple for us. So what was the, everybody knows this, I'm sure. I'll just give a, a quick background. One of the, the, the prayers that we say three times a day, one of the aspects of them is that they are sort of to make up for the, 
sacrifices that were in the temple. Now that we don't have the temple, in the place of those, of those sacrifices, those daily sacrifices, we have our daily tefillahs. So shachras is in place of the tamid shal shachar, the, 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 the uh, continual daily offering. And mincha is in place of the, of the certain types of uh, flower offerings that were given. And myriv corresponds to the burning of certain parts. And of course on Shabbos we have, and Yontif we have musaf. That was for the musaf offering that, that was brought, right? So in other words, our tefillah now is in place of, the, of, of that temple service, of those korbanas. Right? And there's a lot to learn from that. But here particularly, we're, we're drawing it into one particular area. So prayer is in the place of a korban. Ube korban, kasiv be, and it's written about korbanus, about this, the sacrifices. Kol asher boy mum lo yikrav. Any korban, sacrifice, that had a blemish could not be sacrificed. What does that mean though on a deeper level? What does the word korban mean? What does the word um, yikrav mean? It comes from the word from the word to be close, meaning we uh, everyone learns very early on that the translation of korban to sacrifice is a very bad translation. Korban really means something that brings you close. Really, you bring it close, and it brings you close, right? It brings you close to Hashem. That's the purpose of it. So when it says kol asher boy mum lo yikrav, anything that has a blemish, you cannot bring it as a sacrifice. What it means on a deeper level is anyone, any person who has a blemish in their yira, will not be able to come close. Will not be able to come close to Hashem. Will not be able to pray in this way. If we have a blemish in our yira, our prayer will not work the way it's supposed to. But if a person doesn't have a blemish in their yira, like the Zoyar said, in a place where there is fear of Hashem, then he can come close to do his divine service with purity. Right? So the more that we work on ourselves and the more that we turn ourselves into people of shalom, that we're, we're nishlam, we're complete, we're whole, we're one body and soul together that's functioning for the same purpose, oh, now our prayer is going to flow like never before. Like never before. And this is what it's written about the holy, holy, holy Chana. Everybody knows the story of Chana, right? That she, she, she was, a, she was a, a, a Nevi'ah and a prophetess and she didn't have children for a long time. And so she came to the base of Mikdash and she davened there very, very powerfully. And in fact, we learn the Hanhagas and laws of the tefillah of Shemona Esrei, mostly from, from, from Chana. Um, so she davened and she was davening like crazy. She was davening mamish like a Breslover over there. Loud and, and moving and the whole thing, right? She was going for it. And the, uh, the Koyen Gadol over there... Um, um, came to her, Eli, I think it was, was the Queen Gadol at the time, and he, was, and he thought she was drunk. And, and, uh, and he said to her, you know, what are you doing? You can't, you can't come drunk here. And, and she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not drunk. And because of her tremendous Yeras Hashem, she didn't get upset, she wasn't angry, and she answered him that she's just davening for a child, and, she, and she's, she's talking to Hashem from the depths of her heart. And he blessed her and said that she's going to have a child right away, and nine months later, and so it happened. And uh, that's the story. Right? So Chana, it says about Chana over there. And, um, and uh, yeah, so of course, and who was her son? was Shmuel Hanavi, the, the, the prophet Shmuel, who would then go on to anoint David HaMelech and Shaul HaMelech and the holy Shmuel Hanavi. Um, so what does it say about Chana over there? It says... Um, Chana was speaking to her heart on her heart that's how, that's how she was davening she was speaking on her heart says Rabbi Nachman it's through her yira through her fear and awe of Hashem that she merited this high level of tefillah why? that's what the Pasuk is saying because the main aspect of yira is in the heart as we said, 
Only you know privately what's going on in your heart. You can act like someone who fears Hashem. You can wear all the right clothing. You can grow a long beard and sit behind a bunch of books. And it can be all false. Only you know, you and me, Yona, yeah. <laughs> Only we know, really, do we have, are we doing it for the right, do we mean it? Am I being authentic? Right? Or am I a fraud? Right? I'm giving tzedakah. I'm telling everyone, oh, Rabbi Nachman's the best. Uh, I'm so holy. Yeah? I daven this, I daven that. I go to this Kivrei Tzadikim and I do all these things, right? Is it real? Or do I have a big blemish in my era and in my connection to Hashem? Only we know in our heart. So this is when it says, Chana was speaking on her heart. That means that she had this yura in her heart. And it was pure. And it was real. And that's why, that's why she, she, she received the bracha that she's going to have a son. And that son became Shmuel Hanavi. And it's through tefillah that we merit Shalom HaKlali. That means universal peace. Hainu, Shlemus Hailamais, the perfection, the completion of all the worlds. Kial Shem Tefila Nikra Korban, because it's for this reason that prayer is called a Korban, which sacrifice, Korban. Al Shem Keruv Hailamais Lashatle Musan, because that it brings all the universes closer to their perfection. Not only it brings us closer. It brings all the universes closer to their perfection. And we know, um, one of the commentaries says over here, this uh, beautiful idea, I think it was the Mea uh, Nachal maybe, um, a few awesome points over here. And that is that, what is a, what is Rabbi Nachman referring to when he says, Keruv Ha'aylam the, the bringing, bring, bringing the, the worlds, plural, nearer to their perfection. And he says that, that really everything is a world. You know, a person is called, is called, is called a world. It's called, a, it's called an oilam, a person. That's why when, when uh, there was this famous idea that when, when Cain killed, killed Hevel, right? Cain killed Abel in the, in the beginning of Bereshis. <coughs> so the Pusik says that the bloods, plural, of your brother... Are, are crying out from the ground, I think the Pasuk says. And so Rashi says over there, why is it, why is it plural, bloods? Who said the blood, right? Rashi explains, he brings, I think it's a medrash, where he says, it's because that when you kill a person, you don't just kill them. You kill everyone that would have come from them. And all the generations that could have been built, a whole world, a whole oilam, can come from one person. So every person, in a certain sense, is an oilam. And just like all the Olamas, in a Kabbalistic way, have, have you know, ten spheres. Each Olam has ten spheres and five parts Sufim. So too, do we have the same ten spheres and five parts Sufim of our own individual nature? Just like there's a, there are, there's a whole world, every individual person is a world. Just like there's Atsilas and Bria and Yitzira and Asiya, so too, each one of us is like one of those universes. Right? And so tefillah is what brings all of the worlds, whether it's an individual person, or whether it's a community, whether, whether it's, it's, it's a chevra who learns together like us, right? Whether, whether it's the entire world, or the entire Kabbalistic realm, or all of creation, right? Tefillah brings that closer to its perfection. Um, one other aspect before we start the story of Rabbi Barachana is that we, we're, we're talking about Peace within the body. Peace within an individual person, right? And really, and we're talking about bringing all these Olamas back to, their, back to their perfection. This really is the main idea of this whole Torah, right? And what did we say? What's the main kavod, honor of Hashem? Is when Ager, when Yisroi, this week's parsha, comes from being very far away, Right? and comes close to Hashem, comes from being an Avodah Zarah worshiper, and comes to, comes to being a Parsha in the Torah, and the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? That's what brings honor to Hashem, right? And we said, when, a, when, when someone con- converts, when someone does tshuva, this is all coming from far away, close to Hashem, bringing honor to Hashem. 
So the Me'a Nachal says, this is actually what's happening when we're making peace within ourselves. When we have part of us that is far away, that is fighting against us in our mission to come close to Hashem. And we unite, that we fix that up and unite it in the goal to be close to Hashem. We really, that is Kavar Hashem. That's taking that one part of me and bringing it closer to Hashem. It's the same thing, right? So all these things that we're doing, whether it's on a, a, a microcosmic level or a macrocosmic level, it's all fulfilling this, the concept of this entire Torah, of bringing that which is far away close to Hashem. And it all happens through Yira, true truth in my heart, and tefillah. Um, the last thing I'll say before we move on is Rabbi Nachman talks a lot about a pagam in Yira. Now this is very, 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 very important. And one of my favorite topics that Rabbi Nachman speaks about. Rabbi Nachman speaks earlier on about, and later on actually also, in the, we're going to see, about the concept of Yirois Nefulois. Fallen fears. Right? So what's a fallen fear? A fallen fear is when I, I am afraid of something in this world as if it has power over me. Right? Meaning, fear only has one place, and that is with Hashem. That's the only place for fear. The only single place. That's it. Right? And if I'm experiencing fear of things in this world, I'm afraid what's going to be financially. I'm afraid what's going to be with, uh, you know, with my family. What's going to be with my business? What's going to be with the world? COVID, right, is a huge one. What's going to be with COVID? doesn't mean I don't have to be careful. But if I have fear of these things, right, it means that the fear has fallen. The fear is supposed to be with Hashem in its source, in its root, which is what we're talking about here. But if that fear is, is coming to me in the form of COVID, for example, then it's fallen and it's false, right? Because as Rabbi Nachman explains over there, that really that thing has no power whatsoever to, 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 to cause you to be afraid, right? And, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Certain people will have no fear of, of, of a certain aspect of existence, whereas other people will be very afraid of it. Or a person themselves, they can be stressed and terrified and have crazy anxiety over things. And then, after doing tshuva and growing in a muna, they will face the same thing without any fear. Why? Because that thing has no power in, in and of itself. It's only when the fear that's supposed to be on Hashem has fallen and encloses itself over that thing, do I experience fear of it. But really, that fear doesn't exist. It's nothing. There's nothing there to be afraid of whatsoever. So when we say there's a pagam in the yira, that means exactly this. That my yira is supposed to be with Hashem. And because it's not, it's coming out in all these things in my life. Right? So really, you know, this is high level avoida sometimes. But let's say, for example, let's say, for example, if you remember, I told you a story one time about a person who found out that they owed the government $150,000 because they didn't pay their taxes properly, whatever, someone who I'm, who I'm close with. And, and this person, like, could not sleep, could not eat, and, and, and was mamish, like, destroyed, totally destroyed, because of this thing that was going on with them, right? And they were so worried about it. And so I talked to this person for a while, and... You know, just with some practical advice, saying, okay, listen, you know, it's not the end of the world, don't worry, you're not going to jail, you can work out payment terms, and, you know, maybe it won't even be, you'll get, you'll look into it, maybe it's not even going to be that much, and you'll take care of it, and it, it, it'll be fine. You'll have to set up something, but it's going to be fine. You'll get through this, don't worry. 
And it was very hard for this person. But lo and behold, about a month later, I spoke to this person again. And two things happened. First of all, they called and they spoke to CRA. And they were very nice to them. And they said, yeah, okay, yeah, you made a mistake, fine. Let's work out how you're going to pay it back. And not only that, afterwards, their business started making a whole bunch of money and they were able to pay it back very quickly. Right? But they were told they owed a certain amount of money. And they were gripped with fear. Mamish gripped with fear. And what was the fear about? Something that didn't even exist. Something that wasn't even real. A possibility, a possible negative outcome that may or may not even ever come to being. Right? Their life is ruined. They can't do anything because of this possibility that's in their mind, that's not even real. Right? Why? Because the Yira is not where it's supposed to be. The person with Yira Hashem and Amuna would face that situation, and they might get upset still, and they might get a little bit shaken, but they'd say, okay, thank you Hashem for uh, giving me this opportunity to be real for a minute <laughs> and to connect to you and, and to deal, deal with this in the right way and do the right thing. That's putting the Yira in the right place. That person can function, that person can take care of what's need, what needs to be done and move on. Otherwise, it's a fallen fear. It doesn't really exist. It's not really there. It happens in Shaduchim all the time, right? People are, people are, 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 are dating and they're wondering what's going to, you know, the, uh, this person, someone here is going to feel like I'm talking directly to them, but it's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture also, right? I'm, try, I'm, 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 I'm with someone, I'm dating someone, and they have so many good things, but what about this possibility? What about this possibility? What about this possibility? Like all, all these things, you know, no one's perfect. And there's always going to be struggles. And it's always going to be difficult in a marriage, right? You have to work at a marriage to make it good, right? But... If I know that Hashem's with me, and I know that I have a mission, and I know that this other person shares my goal of this mission, so we'll go through it together. And we'll, we'll, we'll work through the issues together, and we know Hashem's going to take care of us, and Hashem's going to give us everything we need. Right? So I can be that person, or I can be paralyzed with fear. Everybody with me? Yeah? Okay. With, with that... Let's move on now to the story of Rabbi Barbar Khan. What? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So let's say you take that theory of your ID plus and you apply that to spheres of caving, which were not supposed to happen. Those iris are not supposed to be down here. This is supposed to be up there. But because of the Bria, God had to put them down here so we could use them to be misakin this oil. Right. So why can you say that the Yira that is maybe not where it's supposed to be is down here so that we could take that Yira now and use it for Kedusha? Just like we're taking that Shvetsa using those Nisoisois for Tikkun. I think you're... Yira is not a bad thing. It's not a blemish. It's a... An elevation thing. Right. Listen, every... Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. So, when, when we elevate the Yira, what are we doing? We're, we're making a Tikkun. We're being Mala Nitzaytzais. The Yira that's fallen is, is exactly because of, of all, these, all these things that we have to fix. If there was no Shira Sakalim, there would be no Shilas, right? There would just be Or, just light. So you're absolutely right, Rabbi Yoyna. And I love this about, about Rabbi Yoyna, that he always wants to take things and put them into a, a, a more positive Lushen. I think it's a beautiful Mida. Right? He's saying, see, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is a terrible thing to have this type of fallen fear. Fallen fear is terrible. We've got to work through this. We can't have it. Rabbi Yoyna says, oh, you know what it really is? is it's, a, it's an opportunity to elevate that fear. This is a being, lifting up Kedusha back to Hashem. Right? Fantastic. Okay, let's go weiter. Okay. Um, page 13. Tess. Rabbi 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 Here we go. This is what Rabbi 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 said. Amar li ahutaya. Certain Arab merchant said to me, Ta va'achve lach heichad nashke arav rakia bahadadeh. 
Come with me and I will show you the place where the earth and the, and the heavens kiss together. Sounds very romantic. Okay. Azli v'chazai. So I went with him and I saw. David kavi kavi. That it was made into a bunch of, there was a bunch of windows in the rekia, like in the, in the, in the firmament, in the, what's it called? Yeah, firmament. Shaklis le saltoi v'anachtia v'kavsa de rekia. So I took my bread basket and I placed it in one of the windows of the, of the Shemaim, of the sky, of the heavens. Bahade de, de matzlena ba'usa v'loi ashkechise. And then after I finished davening, so he put it there so he could pray. After I finished praying, I went back to there, that place, and I couldn't find it. My bread basket was missing from the window in the heavens that I put it. So I said, are there thieves here that stole my bread basket? So the Arab merchant said to me, Galgala de Rekia hu da Hadar. No, 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 no. It's not that someone stole it. It's the the um the sphere of the heaven is turning. And you put your bread basket there and it's turned around in the spheres of the heaven. Natar Adla Machar Kihashta Umashkachla. Wait here until tomorrow at the exact same time and you'll find it. Okay, that's the story. So let me see the Rajbam here to make sure he didn't. Uh... So this place, he says, says the Rajbam, this place where heaven and earth kiss, makom gavoya hayasham, a very high place, shenoishkim yachad zelazeh, that right at the place, right like uh, kilu, you could go up in some type of vessel and and get to that place, right where the sky meets the, the atmosphere. I don't know, whatever. You hear what I'm saying? Where the, I don't know where the stars meet the. I don't know. Okay, the dome of the heaven meets the atmosphere of our existence. I don't know. You're with me though, right? Yeah. And it was not the end of the world, of the earth, because the end of the earth is a distance that, you had, that it takes to walk um, um, 500 years. The Eretz Yisrael, Emtza Isai Shalo Eilam, he, and the Eretz Yisrael is the middle, is the midpoint of the, of the world. Dichsiv, Yoishve al Tabura Aretz, because it says about, about Eretz Yisrael that the dwellers of the belly button of the world, that means the middle. Vahainu, Makoy Moishal Rabba Barachana, that was the place Rabba Barachana was. Right? So it wasn't, I guess, that means it was, wasn't the end of the universe, because that would have taken him. 400 years of walking to get there, of traveling to get there. Maybe it's light years, I don't know. Saltai says, Sal Lechem, that's the bread basket. Very good. Okay, let's see what it means, according to Rabbi Nachman. Okay, Danashke Arab Rikia, this place where earth and heavens kissed. Zebachinas, you probably guessed already. Shalom Ba'atzamov, a person's own inner peace. Ara, the earth, is referring to the physicality of a person, the body of a person, Bechinas Guf. Rekia, the heavens, the heavens, Ze Bechinas Neshama, that's referring to the soul of a person, the Neshama of a person. Kamosh HaKosav, Yikra Al Shamay Me'al, like the Pasuk says in Tehillim, um, he calls to the heavens above, that's referring to the Neshama. Ze Neshama, Ve'al Haaretz, and to the ground he calls Ze Haguf. And the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, that's what the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, and when there's peace between these two things, between my ruchnius and my gashmius, my spirituality and my physicality, right? My soul and my body. When there's peace between those, avdi kave. Windows are created. It's through this that prayer is able to occur. Which is what Rabbi Nachman said before. Kanal, bechinas, like the pasuk says in Daniel. Vechavin pesichan le baaliyase. He 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 davened and he went to a place where there were windows, so he could daven there. Windows are connected to prayer 
in the in the and we see that in Sefer Daniel. Daniel had a had a big decree against him, and so he wanted to go to a place and be in a place where he could pray. And so he went specifically to a place where there's windows. It's actually brought down in halacha that a shul should have windows. Ideally, should have twelve windows in a shul. It's brought down, but there is an Indian to have windows to to be able to see up to the up up to the sky to the outer world when, when you're davening. But in this case, it's it's a code word for tefillah for prayer, right? So through the heavens and earth kissing, we get to tefillah. Through the body and the soul working together, we get to tefillah. And so I took my bread basket and I put it in one of the windows of the, of the Shemaim, of the sky. Salta, my bread basket, what's that referring to, of course? Ze parnasa, that's referring to money, livelihood. Kamoi, Misha Yeshle, Pas So the Gemara says, that someone who has bread in his basket is, approaches his relationship to finances differently. Meaning, the Gemara says there that, 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 that two people will behave differently with regards to money and will be treated differently. Someone who has money will behave differently than someone who spent all their money. Right? They, they feel different about, about their lives. They're going to they, they're gonna be worried about where they're going get, to get, get their next meal from. Whereas someone who still has money doesn't have that feeling. We don't need to go into that. The point being that here over, we're saying that bread, it's not just a coincidence that in English, right, also bread means money. Dough, bread, right? Bread is a general reference in all cultures to sustenance, parasa, money, right? Where's the dough? You know, give me some bread. I don't know. Okay. I'll stay away from uh, impressions. Okay. So, this is Parnasa. Come on, Misha, Shabbos, Pasali. Hainu, Shaloi Ratza, Lasso, like Bashum Asek, Me Iske Olam Haze. So, Rabbi Barbarchana was so holy, he did not want to be involved in any aspects of Olam Haze, of this world. He didn't want to be focused on physical sustenance, Parnasa, money. Rak, Bishvil, Nishmasai. He only wanted to be worrying about his soul, his, his spiritual self. Gam kol tefilasai. Lohi el bishvil akasher nishmasai. Even all of his prayers were only connected to his soul, were only dealing with his spiritual side. Afilu elu tefilais. Ha mufarashim, but tefila. Even those prayers that we say in the Shmon Esrei that are specifically relating to the body. Kagoin, like for example, Rafainu, heal us. That's referring to the body, right? Varechaleinu, and the 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 brachin shmon esrei varechaleinu is talking about the the physical sustenance that we get produce during the year, right? This is physical stuff. So he said those. So what do you mean he was only referring to to his spiritual uh, soul, right? Ushar tzarich aguf. His intentions, his prayer intentions were not referring to his body. Only on his soul. Because he, when he was davening those prayers, he was thinking of, when he was davening for Parnasa, he was davening la Parnasas Nishmasai. U Rifuasa. He was davening what he said. Please Hashem, Rafainu, Venerafe, heal us and we will be healed. He wasn't talking about being sick with COVID. Everyone should be healed who, who, who's suffering. He wasn't talking about, about any disease. He wasn't talking about sick people. He was, he was saying, Hashem, please heal my soul. My soul has, 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 has defects. My soul is, is suffering. Please heal my soul, is what he would say. That was his intentions. He was always aimed towards only his spiritual self. Right? So he put it in the, he took the basket and he put it in the window of the sky. He took his prayers that were meant for the body. That's his bread basket. He's going up to the place where heaven and earth kiss. Right? And he's taking his bread basket. That refers, meaning he's aiming his prayer for sustenance up to the windows of heaven. That's what he's doing in the story. 
which are the Latorich Guf. And he took that, va'ancha betfila, and he placed it into the tefila, hakol letzorech nishmasai. That everything should be for the needs of his soul only. Why did he do that? Or how did everything work out through that? Ki mimela kishen niskan sham baruchnius, niskan gam begashmius. Because if, as I'm saying over the story, you thought to yourself, come on, give me a break already. <laughs> right? I need to daven for, for, I need money, right? I need sustenance. I need to daven for people to get better. I need to daven for myself to get, to, 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 have, to have a refua. What do you mean? Now Rabbi Nachman is telling me I can't do that? I have to only daven for spirituality, for ruchnius? What about all these things? So he says, no, because Rabbi Barbarchana knew that once something is fixed in the realm of ruchnius, it automatically is fixed in the realm of physicality. So when, when something needs to be healed with my neshama, then, and I heal that, it will somehow automatically make a healing in my body. Something needs to be, I need to provide my soul with more sustenance, spiritual sustenance. Maybe I'm not giving it enough Torah, enough, enough, enough hisboitadus, enough, enough attention, I'm not paying enough attention and, and giving sustenance to my spiritual self. Maybe if I do that, then, this is what the commentaries say, if I, if I give my soul the sustenance it needs, then my sustenance downstairs will start to flow. When I take care of the problem upstairs, it will cause the flow to happen downstairs. Right? So it's not that he didn't require food, or he didn't require any of these things. He just knew that you've got to go to the source and tackle it at that place first. So what happened? Va'ad de matzlena ba'usa ba'usi lo yashkach. And when I finished my tefillah, I couldn't find it. Hainu acharkach lo yimatzak ede parnasos parnasosay. But something happened to Rabbi Barbarchana that after he finished davening, so he did this. He went up and he he made a tikkun. He fixed up his neshama. He davened only for his neshama. He only prayed for spiritual reparation and sustenance and whatnot. But when he finished and he came back down. He didn't have any sustenance. He didn't have parnasa physically. He didn't have he didn't have the money that he was hoping. The the gates didn't open. Things weren't flowing. Business wasn't going well. Right? Afal Pisha Tikin Baruchnius, even though he made a tikkun, a, a correction in spirituality, Afal Pikain Loin Nimshach Loy Shefa Bagashmius, the flow of physical wealth did not come down. What's happening? Amar Ikaganvehacha. So he said, Are there thieves over here that have stolen this, this from me? Shagoinvi ma shefa shali that have stolen the shefa, the 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 um the uh, the, the, the 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 flow of, of Parnasa from me? Meaning on a deeper level, when you make a tikkun and you, you are masakin the sir of Malchus, everything starts to flow. When Malchus is flowing, everything flows through Malchus. So he made these Kabbalistic spiritual reparations and fixes. And so everything should flow. So if it's not flowing, he, he asked, are there some kind of negative spiritual forces, prosecuting angels or something, that are blocking this from me? The, it should be, everything's flowing now. Why am I not receiving? Is what he asked. Galgala de Rekia de Hadra. So the Taya answered him, Oh, it's the sphere of heaven which turned. The Gilgul of the sphere of heaven is the reason that you're not getting your Parnasa. Hainu, Gilgulin the Nishmasin. Meaning, the reincarnation of souls is the reason why you're not receiving Shefa. He Hagairemis She'ein Latzadik Kede Parnasasai. This is what causes that it's possible that you could have a complete Tzadik who does not have his Parnasa needs met. Kamosha Kasev, Gabe, Rabbi Pedas. Like the Gemara says in Tainus about Rabbi Pedas. E bias de Ichruvalma, the Efshar de Ivres, Beshaita de Mezaina. So, stories like this. Rabbi Pedas was someone who was, who was very poor. And, and he had a very difficult time. And he, he, he asked Hashem, please, please, please take care of me. And he got so hungry and he was in such bad shape that he fainted one time. And when he did that, Hashem came to him 
and said to him, Okay, listen, you're, you're asking me that you should have a lot of parnasa. You want to be rich? Okay, if you want that, I could destroy all of the creation and recreate everything. And maybe in that way, you will be brought into existence in a way that you'll receive a lot of parnasa. So the deeper, the, the, the simpler way of understanding this is that, you know, it's kind of a way that we address the, the question of one way, not the way, that we address the question of, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Or, you know, why do you see that there's people in the world who are terrible people and who are tremendously prosperous? Why do you have these people who are, you know, tycoons and, 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 and people who are, who are being, who are being um, brought down in the media because they're so terrible and so mean to people, yet they're billionaires and millionaires and they're doing so well, and you have tremendous tzaddikim or just wonderful, nice, good people who are not doing so well. How can you have a tzaddik who doesn't, who, who's not doing well and a rasha who's doing so well? How can you have someone who has to lose money? How can you have someone who has to lose chas shalom family members? Has to be sick. Has to be in a bad situation. And they're a holy person. How could it be? So one portion of, of, of a way to understand this, it's not the whole picture, but one portion of a way to understand this is that the, what's called Raza Dil Gagulin, the secrets of reincarnations. And that we know that Judaism, of course, is, uh, is, is a religion of reincarnations. And that we come here often from a previous life. And we have in this life corrections we have to make. We have to make tikkunim. There's things from, from, from the past that have to be fixed. And sometimes in order for that to happen, they have to be fixed in a way that they don't make sense here. Because if they made sense here, they would be tikkunim for now. So it has to happen in a way that it doesn't make sense here because it's a tikkun from before. You know, we tell this, I've told this story probably on this group probably three times now. But I'll, I'll say it very bekitzer about the person who came to the Baal Shem Tov and, and, and had a din Torah, that he had an argument with a friend, a holy person, that he owed him $1,000. And he said, no, I don't owe you $1,000. What are you talking about? But they're both holy people and so they said, let's go to a Bezdin, a Jewish court, and ask them. And so they went to the Jewish court, and the judges on the Jewish court were very holy, good people. And they know that the Gemara says that when three judges sit to judge a case, the Shekhinah is with them, meaning the Divine Presence is with them, they cannot make a mistake. So the judges were holy, the two people coming together were holy, so they went, and they, 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 they had their case, and at the end... The judgment came out that, yeah, he does, in fact, owe this person $1,000. So, he goes, he pays the person $1,000. And afterwards, he comes to see the Baal Shem Tev. And he says to the Baal Shem Tev, Rebbe, you know, he tells him the whole story. And he says, so, 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 the Baal Shem Tev, so, okay, so you paid. And you were makabal the din. Great. Why, why are you here? So he said, Rebbe, the problem is, is that I know that I really didn't owe him the money. I know the facts. I know how, what happened. I really don't owe him the money. So how could it be? How could it be that I, 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 I went to a Bezdin and the Shekhinah was there, everybody was holy, and it came out that I owe him the money? So the Baal Shem Tev said to him, oh, you're right, you do know the facts of this case and you know exactly what happened. But what you don't know is that in a previous life, you, your soul was together with his soul. And in that previous life, you're, you did something and you owed him a thousand dollars somehow and you didn't pay it. And so you had to come back and make a tikkun, make a correction for that. So you had to be in a situation where you really wouldn't owe him the money, but you would end up paying it. And you had to trust in Hashem and you had to trust in the, in the judges and that the Shekhinah was there and you had to do it in that way so that you were really repaying your debt for the, for, from the previous time. So this is what Rabbi Nachman is bringing down over here from the story of Rabbi Bar-Khana. 
You know why you don't have Parnassah right now? You're right. You opened the gates. And you made the tikkunim. You, did, you fixed everything up up there. And, and everything's flowing. But because of Gilgulim, because of reincarnations, because of who you are and who you were, it happens to be that your tikkun right now is that you're not supposed to receive this money. You're not supposed to be a rich person right now. And you have to deal with that and make your correction that way. And that's what he said. Like we said, Rabbi Vidas. So, let's just finish this last paragraph and uh, then we're done. A very short paragraph. And this is what it means that the, it says about the, about the Noah's Ark. It says, make compartments for the Ark. Kinim Taseloteva. This is the Medrash. The Medrash says, Ma kinim metarin just like kinim kan birds, an offering of birds, purify a matsura. A matsura is the person with uh, tsaras, with a skin affliction, sometimes they call it leprosy. Af tevasicha metaratacha. So too, your teva, your ark is your purification, Noah. Your ark is your purification. So what's, what's the matsura? Why does a person get the skin affliction? Because they spoke Lashon Hara. They spoke negatively about other people. They caused arguments. They caused negative feelings. They caused Pirud, separation. They caused, they caused there to be not peace. Right? When you talk about a person in a bad way, and you say Lashon Hara about a person, you are causing the opposite of peace to exist. You're removing peace. You're creating anger. You're creating separation. That's what the Mitzurah does to re- to, to, in order to, uh, to, to, to receive the skin affliction. So a Mitzurah is zed nirgan mafid alaf. That's, that's what the Pasuk says in Mishle of a person who, the whisperer, who separates close friends, someone who goes around and says Lashon Hara to people and causes a separation between these close friends. Umafrid ben ish ishtoy and causes there to be a separation between husband and wife, chas v'shalom. This type of person making a separation. That's, that's kinim. That's what fixes up. That's what is metaher, the metzairah, is these birds, kinim. The offering of birds. And because of this, that person has to sit out on their own, has to be exiled outside of the camp. The kinim, and the kinim, the, 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 uh, the, the bird offering, purifies him. So too, your teva, your ark. Hainu tevas hatafila. Meaning teva means ark and teva means words. Teva means words. Just like that purifies the Mitzurah who causes separation, so too your words, which is your tefillah, will cause your purification. Masaknin es hamachloikes. That will fix up the machloikes, voice shalom, the, the arguments, and will create peace. Haklali, shalom mekol is the peace of all of the worlds. V'zeh she mesayamin hatafila b'shalom. And this is why we finish our tefillah. Why the last prayer that we say, Nishman Esrei, is the, is, is, is the prayer for peace. Wow. So there's a lot to talk about here, and we'll, we'll, we'll address a little bit of it next week. But the main thing, the main idea over here is that is this concept that when we make this peace happen, when we put the yira in the right place, and we, we, we cause ourselves to be people of peace, we then draw peace into the world. When we, you know, they say that you have to, um, uh, when you're working on someone, if you want to go fix the world, look in your own backyard first, right? This is what, this is what Rabbi Nachman is telling us over here. First, work on the peace of your own body and soul, your own character traits, that you're not fighting against yourself all the time. Become a person of shalom, a complete person, a whole person, where your whole self is working towards the goal of getting close to Hashem. And once you do that, you will be able to draw beauty into the world and to draw peace into the world and to fix up the world. And um, if I could just say quickly, before we open it for questions, you know, this is not 
we often run into this problem with Rabbi Nachman, where he talks about a certain level of existence that is the level of a tremendous tzaddik. Right? And he's bringing the story of Rabbi Bar Khanna here, talking about this level where you are living perfection. That's what shalom means. Nishlam, shalom, means perfection. Completeness. Oh yeah, when you're in that state, yeah, everything's flowing, everything's perfect. Right? So how do we relate to that? So this is a process of, like, like our lives, is a process of growth. And like we said earlier, that we're always trying to take off the layers of soiled garments and get closer to Hashem, get closer to perfection, and reach the higher levels. So you know what? We're going to struggle. And we're going to face situations where we realize that we are fighting against ourselves. And that we're not perfect yet. And we're not whole. But we can see how we grow. And we can see how we become closer to Hashem. And every time I face a new situation, and I'm aware of what's going on, and I'm not fighting a war against myself, or even though I am, I, I realize what's going on, and I take my time, and I say, okay, I'm going to have to get through this. I know right now this is a difficult situation for me. I know I'm fighting against myself. I know I have fears, and I, uh, right? But you know what? I'm going to work through this, and I'm going to get through this. That's the next step. And then the next time, you'll identify it earlier, and you'll, 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 you'll face it in a different way, and you'll keep growing and keep growing. And then Hashem will hit you with something harder than you've ever had. And you'll step back and you'll say, what now? This now? I thought I was doing good. <laughs> now I get something that's like way harder than anything I ever faced? Chas shalom, right? What's happening? Oh, yeah, this is your odd sign. You're getting higher and higher. Now Hashem, you just got to a new level. And now you, a new level of emuna, a new level of peace, a new level of, of existence. Oh, and now... The, the forces of, of the negative spiritual forces in that level are going to give you a new challenge to try and stop you. Right? And you can see from that that I'm growing, I'm becoming closer to Hashem, closer to Amuna, closer to being Nishlam, closer to having Shalom. Right? So we should just all know that this is a process that we all have to work through. And we should always be looking and, and, and using the Torah of Azamra on ourselves and seeing our good points, seeing where we're, 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 we're making strides, where I'm becoming better in Amuna and better in, in Shalom, and recognizing them so that I know the next time I face something else, I'm on the right track and I can keep going. So we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about the depths of, uh, of what we just read about the story of Rabbi Barakana next time. And uh, just uh, our, if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd like to hear comments before we finish up. Please go ahead. And if not, two thumbs up. We will see you all next week. Everybody have an amazing week. And, uh, and, and open those channels. Fix that shalom. And let all of the shefa flow into the world. Bezra Hashem. Have a great week. Love you guys.